Hi there. Welcome to Game of Your Own, a podcast about women who work in sports. I'm your host, Jahan Blake. I bring you stories of women who are game changers, incredible leaders, and trailblazers in the sports industry. You will get a behind the scenes look of how they navigated their journey, valuable lessons they learned along the way, and advice for high achieving women just like you. I'm excited you're here. Let's do this. Self-doubt, a phrase we all know way too well. We've all experienced it. It's really good at popping up before a big presentation, before a big meeting that you're leading, before you ask for that promotion or raise you know you deserve, or before that big interview. But what if you could take your self-doubt and turn it into confidence? Let me say that one more time. What if you could take your self-doubt and turn it into confidence? That is exactly what my next guest did. Listen in as Yvonne carrasco Shalme, Senior Director of Baseball at Wasserman, shares her journey. You can hear how she went from the woman with self-doubt to someone who created her own position. I'm so grateful Yvonne was super transparent with us. She doesn't look back at these times of self-doubt as a failure. She actually looks back and is grateful for all the lessons that it taught her. Yvonne and I had so much fun talking that we lost track of time. And she has such great advice that we couldn't cut much out. So today you'll hear part one of our conversation and next week you'll hear the rest. We hope you enjoy. Yvonne, welcome to Game of Her Own. Thanks for joining. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. Um you know, to be here with you today. Take us back, back in time when you first fell in love with sports. Actually, I, you know, as you know, um, I'm a baseball, baseball lady, a baseball pro, but honestly, the first time I fell in love with sports was with soccer. Reason being, um, my parents are South American, they're from Ecuador, and that's the top sport there. So my first big memory was going to Copa America, which is the um, South American football tournament that it usually hosted out of South America. Anyway, so it was that particularly, I want to say some, sometime in the early 90s, was in Ecuador. And I, when I was a kid, I spent probably most summers over there just with family, et cetera. And I got to go to a game. It was U.S. soccer versus, I don't remember the team. But I just was so excited to see American football players on the pitch just being a part of seeing like basically both of my cultures, you know, being in Ecuador and seeing the, the American soccer players like get, you know, warm up for the game. We were there so early, you know, had pretty good seats, like my dad treated us. And um, I just remember looking around and thinking like, this is really cool. And like, what are all these people doing who are on the field who aren't soccer players? So I think that was my first like, aha, like, what is this? And I love it. Ah, that's so interesting. So how old were you at the time? Probably 10 or 11, I would say. Okay. And so you're looking yeah. around and you saw all the people on the field who weren't playing and were right. intrigued. Who weren't obvious like coaches or, you know, other, I just took note of, or just noticed that there were individuals who weren't clearly players or clearly coaches uh-huh. who were some sort of staff member. And I wondered and to myself, like, I wonder what their job is. Like what, like what's going on? That's so oh, yeah. funny. So I can't believe I'm about to tell you the story. So when I used to watch sports and I would see people on the field who were in suits, I didn't understand them. And I actually, <laughs> I can't believe I'm telling this. I actually didn't like them. And I was like, they have nothing to do with the game. It's all of the players. The players make okay. the game. And little did I know when I got much older, this is when I was younger. When I got older, I was like, oh, there is a team behind the team. Like it is completely different. When did you make that like jump? I mean, being at 10 or 11 and knowing, oh, I'm interested in the people who are on the sidelines doing work. Like, when did right. you realize, like, I want to work in sports? Well, John, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, when you're a daughter of immigrants, I'm a proud daughter of immigrants, usually your sort of like career options are limited. Like your parents are always saying, like, you, you should be a doctor, or you should be a lawyer. It's very clear cut because there's just not a knowledge of American culture and different careers um, not for everyone, but for most kids in my position, um, you know, with parents like mine, we just didn't have that open knowledge of like what career paths were, were out there that weren't the traditional doctor, lawyer, et cetera. So I actually kind of muted those, you know, interests that I had and kind of left it on the back burner 
probably when I was college, I went to BU, Boston University. Mm -hmm. I started to be more curious, particularly about the Red Sox, because that was right around the time, I believe, they finally won a World Series. So obviously, being in a sports town like Boston, I was reinvigorated with my interest in sports. How could you not be, right? I was like, this is crazy. Like, this town, especially around my campus, insanely obsessed with the Red Sox. Like, this is a phenomenon. I, like, need to learn more about it. Fast forward a couple years in, I was pre-med. And then I shocked my family two years in. I told my mom, I'm like, I have to change my major. I want to do PR. She was like, what is PR? And I explained it to her and kind of discussed what I thought my path would be and what I would pursue. And she's like, you're going to have to talk to your dad and see what he thinks and whatnot. So it's this whole fiasco of like, oh my goodness, what is this? What's going on? Talked to my dad. I explained to him what I was hoping to do, change my major um, to PR and focus and hopefully get the door open for me in sports somehow without any connections. And uh, I just remember telling him, like, I promise you I will make it work. Just please, like, (laughs) give me, like, let me know that you support me in this, even though you don't understand. Like, I will make it work. Like, I just said it was. So he's like, all right, fine. So my parents were like, not really getting it yet. And they wouldn't wouldn't get it until years later, I'm sure we'll get there. But so that was the first, the turning point, I would say, probably around after sophomore year. So I switched literally two years. And I I had enough time to kind of complete all the coursework to be in comm at BU and then do all the PR work. I want to bring this up because I think it's important. When I was reflecting, thinking about talking with you, I'm like, there's so many points that if I'm honest, I would do differently. And I think we don't talk about that enough. So I'm going to probably give you a lot more of what I would do differently than sort of tell you all my success stories. Um, Ooh, I think people what are going to love that. I love that. So let's rewind back to Yvonne in college, junior year. There Wait, was can we a- go back even further? The Red Sox, you were there, were you a freshman in 2004? So I graduated 2003. It was the buildup. So they, they won 2004. So I missed it by a year. But by the time it was like, I would say those like last couple of years in college, you kind of already saw the team had already kind of like started to put itself together. Like Uh there was, but, but you know what, Boston and you have obviously much experience in that market. It didn't even matter. The first couple of years were there, if they were, I can't remember if they were playing well or not, but it didn't matter. I mean, Red Sox fans were Red Sox fans that you could hear, you know, Fenway Park, the crowd at Fenway Park. Even if I wasn't at a game, I'd be walking home from a class and there was a game going on because I would take kind of like evening classes because for professors were um, like real life professors, PR professors, they'd like come and teach after their day job. Mm-hmm. Anyway, right. so you'd be walking home, there'd be like a, a, a ball game going on and you'd hear the crowd. I mean, it just was, it was always like that. It was pretty, pretty spectacular to just be around that environment and kind of start to understand the beast that was, you know, the baseball. I love that story because I, we were living like parallel lives. Like we didn't know each other in Boston. We didn't meet until LA. But same thing for me, I'm in Boston getting my master's at Emerson and had like no interest in baseball. Maybe a year prior, I kind of fell in love with baseball and I became obsessed and it was just being around the Red Sox. You're right. And like, I would go to games just to sit behind a a pole because that's all I could get was obstructed view for like a really big game. And I loved it. I didn't even care. Like I said, I leaned to the side a little bit to watch the game, but it was that city and their love for the team that made me want to stay there and work in sports. And it sounds like you were having that same moment and you invigorated you and you were like, I, this is what I want to do. So much so that you stopped pre-med, had difficult conversations with your family. I don't know about you, but it's easier for me to have difficult conversations with my mom than my dad because my dad's a little scary. I love you, dad, but he's a little scary. And so I can't imagine telling my parents pre-med, sorry, nope, I want to do PR. That's oh, it was a very difficult conversation. And to have to explain. And just the like initial reaction was very tough to take because you start to question, you know, and this will happen to you throughout your life when, you know, your goals or your, you know, it doesn't even have to be your parents, your goals or your hopes aren't fully understood. And you get that initial like, hmm, um, all right. And it just, you start to question yourself too. And you're like, oh my God, am I doing the right thing? So that was my first moment of, is this right? Am I willing to bet on myself to make this work? Because I felt like I owed it to my parents, especially being, you know, there's this whole different experience being the daughter of immigrants, right? You feel like you have to almost over deliver to 
repay the sacrifice that your parents, you know, made to come to a whole different country to allow you to have these opportunities, education, career, et cetera. And I did that on myself. I said, I, I can, I'm going to do this. I can do this. I switched majors. Uh-huh. There's a, a course requirement in the PR. I don't know if it is now because it's been so long, but at Com and at BU, you had to take a course that was like an internship. So the first day of class, you go in there and there's like basically a booklet of available internships that every student in the, in the class, you know, raises their hand, volunteers take it. So basically kind of like the first person to raise their hand, like, okay, you're going there, you're going there. Very, I mean, it was a really cool program, actually. The things I would do differently. I remember sitting in that class and I don't remember what in particular the internship entailed, but there was one with the Red Sox that was on the table Mm -hmm. and the professor called it out. And I remember sitting there thinking, like, wanting to raise my hand, Mm -hmm. but I didn't because I said, I don't know enough about baseball. I'm not ready for that. How how could I possibly succeed and do well, you know, at the Red Sox without, like, I just completely doubted myself, didn't raise my hand and ended up doing a, a nonprofit internship. And worked the Boston Marathon. So that was probably my first um, little sports experience is working the Boston Marathon in that capacity. But I can't tell you how many times early on in my career, I thought about, well, what would have happened if I would have raised my hand? Like knowing what I know now, which is that I'm a quick learner. I love baseball. I mean, I've been in it 13 years now. Who's to say what would would happen if I would have been the, I could have had a World Series ring. Who knows? (laughs) That you know? is, that's very true. You, know? you can have two or three of them. That's so true. <laughs> wow. Um, so but, self-doubt stopped you from raising your hand. Is that what you're saying? 100%. I think that happens a lot, you know, for women in sports, especially early on. And I'll add another layer to that, particularly Latinas in sports and Latinas like me who are da- a daughter of immigrant. You always have that self-doubt because you feel like you have no frame of reference. Like you don't have, you don't tend to have a relative who's worked in American sports or a friend of the family who gives you that confidence is that you could do it. Like, trust me, like get in there, you're smart enough, you do it. So it does take a little bit of a process and it's different for everyone. But for me that, you know, turning that, not turning it down, but not having the confidence to go in there and and learn. I mean, what is an internship for really? It's to learn. I should have just thrown myself in there, but I also think those moments of self-doubt end up shaping you and they come back to help guide you for the next opportunity if you're so lucky to be afforded one and then you have that much more confidence. So there is kind of like a a lesson to be learned here. It isn't like, oh my gosh, I didn't take that opportunity and never worked in baseball ever again. (laughs) You know, like we're we're not having that conversation. So it is a very important part of the journey and a normal part of the journey to acknowledge that you're not always gonna put yourself out there and maybe have those moments of self-doubt that do kind of temporarily negatively impact your, your flow. Uh but it's not going to stop you. It's just a little roadblock. Self-doubt, it's there, right? We all have it. Anyone who doesn't have it isn't listening to this podcast, right? And they're not, they're superhuman. So self-doubt, everyone deals with it now and then. So you dealt with it early, you were in college. And what would you, it's a hot topic with a lot of my coaching clients. So what would you do differently in that moment? Do you wish, like, would you have raised your hand? Like, what would you have done differently? Or what did you do in the future next time opportunities came up and self-doubt kind of almost stopped you? I definitely would have raised my hand. I think that, again, it was a learning process for myself, not having a frame of reference. So it is quite possible I wasn't fully knowledgeable about the fact that what an internship truly meant, which is completely a learning experience. Like mm-hmm. that basic of a thing, I might not have really fully understood that. And I'm not entirely sure how, you know, that could have been made easier for me to understand, but how did I use that and move forward? So this other internship I took obviously put me in a position to work the Boston Marathon, which was sports related and was a very positive experience. I did know after that, because it was just, I believe that was my senior year that that class took place. And also important to know, and we could probably have, this could be a whole nother podcast, but sometimes, you know, for certain students, you aren't able to take as many unpaid internships as you would want to. So what happens is like you're graduating college and I had all these odd jobs that I did because they were paid. I helped do taxes in Brookline. 
Um, I worked for a financial manager, like as a kind of a temp assistant in the financial district, things of that nature that were, were productive, but honestly, I did it because I needed the extra money, you know, uh -huh. to get through school and that. Come graduation, like I probably didn't have that much of a stacked resume as other students wanting to work in sports. And I knew that, and that was okay. So, you know, what I set out to do was just kind of get my foot in the door in PR in general, meaning my first job out, like I did not particularly care to sit around to wait for a sports specific PR opportunity, which are quite competitive anyway, to come around. I said, you know what, I'm going to take a PR job, get myself seasoned and working with media, mm -hmm. you know, pitch stories and that, get that on my resume. So I started actually in, in tech and um, video game PR. And I did that for a year. Knowing that, I knew that that would help me kind of get into a bigger PR agency and have probably more specific clients that would help me get a resume that would actually get me a phone call, you know, from a sports organization. Again, this is, you know, my case, everyone's different, but I didn't know anyone in sports when I first started out at all. I didn't even know someone who knew someone. I mean, it just was that far off for me. Right. Completely far off. So my next job, um, I worked for a large PR agency called Golan Harris, and I started to do automotive PR and clients like Yamaha, et cetera. So more of those like sorts of automotive realm in the capacity of the automotive client, which was Toyota at the time. I actually was able to work in-house at Toyota out in um, Torrance. I was in Torrance two days a week in, in their office. So this was my first in-house experience. And I'm like, I, this is what I'm about. Like, I need to go in-house somewhere. I need to figure this out. I need to keep progressing to my goal, which is to work in sports. So in Toyota's capacity, I helped support sports sponsorships, which was ding, 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 like finally, right? Like I'm yeah. finally making some progress. At that time, I was supporting their Super Bowl commercial PR. And they had an ad at the time for the Camry. I don't remember the year, but it was a bilingual advertisement. So it was the first bilingual TV ad to run during the Super Bowl. And I supported it with PR. And at that time, you know, I'm starting to really learn all the ins and outs of like what goes behind sports. Like, wow, there's this thing called sports sponsorship and brands like Toyota pay the NFL X amount to have an ad running during the Super Bowl. What else is going on? So, you know, slowly things are starting to happen. And this is about two and a half years out of college. Not too terrible. <laughs> Not too That's terrible. really good. Yeah. Wheels are really turning, right? And I think this is an important pivot. During that time, I realized like I had not fully harnessed the fact that I was bilingual and had the superpower of being a Latina. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and especially in this campaign, I said, wait a minute here. Like I can be doing these things in English and Spanish. Like this could be the way I open the door for myself. Like a guy, I might have found my niche. So anyway. I um, left that agency to work for a Latino PR marketing agency, more of a small, smaller shop. It's called Sportivo. It's based out of Santa Monica, still exists. At the time, they had Nike as a client, and mm -hmm. I was assigned to be the account manager for Nike. Ding, 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 like huge move, right? I'm like, finally, here we are. Like the resume is looking good. I have Toyota in there. I'm managing the Nike account. And uh, I want to kind of touch on one thing that is extremely important, I think, for, for young women to consider. Consistency is huge. You know, it wasn't like, okay, I'm here for this job and six months out, I'm moving right along. I knew that it was going to take time to really fully, you know, for you to fully immerse and learn and progress. You have to make a commitment. Now, it doesn't have to be several years. I'll get to that later in terms of other lessons that I've learned along the way. But to me, I said, I have to do this for at least a year because I think that's meaningful on a resume for someone like myself who's trying to build. So I think I did about a year and a half at Golden Harris at this new position. I did exactly a year. Then the huge opportunity came up, which is with the Dodgers. Woo -woo. All right. So before we get to the Dodgers, which is where yeah. we got to meet. So it sounds like to me, what I'm hearing is in this two and a half year time, okay, you had some regret for not raising your hand, but it was a lesson learned. You gave yourself some grace. You didn't beat yourself up. You ended up getting a really cool internship working with the Boston Marathon. Then you were just intentional about all of the jobs that you took to get to sports. And so what I'm seeing is all this great work experience that you have, you bring in a unique perspective. First, if you had got the job with the Red Sox and stayed in sports the entire time, 
you have a totally different, unique perspective, which I think a lot of teams now are looking for. That's what I seem to see as the newer trend is looking for people who haven't been in baseball forever, right? And trying to bring in unique experiences. And, and that's what you did. I think that's a perfect transition. And so it turns out, even with that tiny roadblock and all the sort of twists and turns that my career took early on and going from video games to automotive to, you know, finessing and elevating and honing in on my skills in terms of Latino PR marketing and also communicating with media in Spanish and building that out. All those things led to me being 100% qualified for a job listing at the Dodgers, which was manager of PR. And they were specifically looking for someone, I believe it was communicated in the listing, you know, Spanish language bilingual preferred. So that listing was on, gosh, I want to say we're speaking, we're talking years back now. (laughs) We've been in in this world so long, you know, that this is going to, you're going to be like, oh, I remember those days. I believe the job listing was on Craigslist. It might might have been on Craigslist. No way. Yes. I'll have to look. I'll have to dig back. And I remember asking my hiring manager, Josh Rowich, and he's like, I put it everywhere because I didn't want to get the same candidates. Okay. So I believe it was on that website. If not, it wasn't on anything obvious like Teamwork Online or anything like that. And by the way, at that time, I didn't even really know Teamwork Online. I wasn't scouring those pages. I was predominantly scouring team um, websites. But a friend, a colleague of mine at that agency I worked with saw that listing and was like, Yvonne, this is it for you. This you've been talking about wanting to shift over to, you know, LA sports forever. Like, this is your job. I looked at it. I read the job description. And once again, let's go back to the theme of self-doubt. I said, Josie, no, I'm not ready for that. I'm not. No way. I, I said, I don't think I have enough years experience. I've only been at Sportivo like 10, 11 months at the time. I don't know, maybe over, 11, you know, not even a year. I don't even know if I'll get a call back. And she said, try, just go for it. And I think that also is an important element because I think throughout your career, you're going to have, and in my experience, I, I've been super blessed that I've had these really super awesome women that have come into my life, like mm-hmm. <laughs> always seemingly at the right time who are like, are you kidding me? Go for it. Or like just giving you that positive reinforcement and, and it works and it helps because your colleagues, you understand each other. You're on the same journey. Mm-hmm. A lot of the times these women have been of similar background to myself. So we like understand what it's taken to get to the point that we are, et cetera. So at Josie's recommendation, I applied for the job. I polished up my resume. I wrote a cover letter that I was really proud and confident in that I felt like displayed who I was. And Josh Rowish, who's now an SVP at the Diamondbacks, at the time he was the director of PR at the Dodgers. We're still friends. Um, he's a great person. He called me the next day. I think it was one day. And what? he said, well, yeah, he's like, can you be available for, you know, phone interview? I think that, that was the first round. Right. Mm-hmm. And I was just blown away. I'm like, no, I'm like, I am going to have a phone call with the Dodgers. This is crazy. Mm-hmm. You know, I have so many questions for you. First, yeah. You got a call in one day. That's amazing. And prior to that, though, you were thinking, uh, I don't have enough experience. This isn't for me. Like, I know what made you want to apply. It was that you have, you know, you're surrounded yourself with great women. And so they push you because they see what you don't see. What was it that you didn't think you had enough of? I'm like, when you said that, I was shocked. I was like, Wait, what? <laughs> like, knowing what you did at the Dodgers, I was, I was so surprised to hear that. Yeah, it's interesting. I just, again, without a frame of knowledge and full um, understanding of the sports industry world, absolutely no one to, I think it got better at the time when I was at Sportivo because I bounced a lot of ideas off of my client, JC Prieto, who was the PR manager at Nike. Mm -hmm. Her parents are from Mexico. So she was a first generation Mexican American, another key person in my journey. It was through her that I started to have some real conversations about you know, how many years did it take for her to get that Nike job? What comes along with being the PR manager for Nike in her, in her role? Things of that nature. She's probably the first sports industry person 
that I was able to have these conversations with and gain a little bit more of knowledge from. Mm -hmm. So I was in a, a little bit of a better spot to answer, to answer your question. I just still didn't think I had enough experience in my head. I was thinking that I'd be up against someone with, I don't know, a few more ex years experience than, than I had, but mm -hmm. that self doubt thing was a theme in my career early on that I constantly had a battle. And I'm being real with you, like that was probably one of my biggest challenge. Like, I, I feel like there's like a saying, like you're your, not your own worst enemy, but you present, you, you yourself are your biggest roadblock if you allow yourself to be. And I can tell you that early on in my career, you know, in those early 20s to mid 20s, like I was my biggest roadblock you know, having those moments. But like I said, luckily I did have, you know, these women in my corner and my mom and my sister as well have always, oh gosh, mm -hmm. always dispelled these doubts in my mind. Like, go for it. You, you got it. I love um, that. Having the women so, uh, in your corner is, is huge. Like that's a, a, yeah. a big part of it. And I think that, that you're very, you're so lucky to have that. Is there anything else yeah. that helped you kind of conquer or overcome that self-doubt? I think with anything in life that you have doubt with in terms of what you do professionally, personally, or whatnot, I think it's a constant education process and just really finding any way to fully understand whether it's what's needed for a particular job or fully understand and immerse, and immerse yourself in an industry that you don't feel like you're qualified enough to be in, learn more about it. And that's pretty much what I did. I mean, I was working events at that agency with Nike, mostly in Southern California. I did work on a women's run up in San Francisco. That was probably my first sort of sports travel opportunity. But just observing, asking questions to people who were already seasoned in those roles, you know, any opportunity, even if it was like working an event, right? Let's use the women's run up in San Francisco. There was a senior level executive there who was part of it. And we were kind of in a room having a meeting, logistics meeting, even side conversations where you walk out and say, introduce yourself. Like, you know, hi, so-and-so, I'm Yvonne. I work for Sportivo and, and JC, uh, you know, over at Nike LA. I'm here for this event. Can I ask you a couple questions? I'm really excited to be here. And just getting any sort of piece of advice, even in passing, like literally leaving a meeting and introducing myself and just walking out, you know, the hotel conference room, just having a very brief conversations, all these little tidbits of, of information that you're able to gather just by putting yourself out there really helps, really helps. Cause sometimes it's all you, honestly, that's all you've got to kind of like hang your hat on. I mean, if you don't do that, like you just, it's easier now too. And I think not easier, but I think young women these days are fortunate enough to have like this vast ne network of social media. We're talking about like the early, gosh, this had to be like 2004 to 2006, right? Mm -hmm. I got hired at the Dodgers in 2007. Around that time, I feel like is when Twitter took off. These are like during the times where there wasn't that vast social network. Now you're able to have these side conversations over LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. You can literally find anyone. I probably would have done my research and like, who is the director of PR of the Dodgers and found that person. Okay, great. And maybe like scroll the feed and try to you know, see what they're interested in and mm -hmm. follow them to see if they post job opportunities. I mean, there's this vast network that I don't think you and I had early on. No. And no, no, I think all. that it is a tool that, that should be utilized, um, obviously in a professional and appropriate way, but it is a, an, an added layer that, good Lord, if, if I had that back then. Uh, I know. Yes. You know, what's really interesting about that is so, so the women that I work with, a lot of times, like 90% of the time, they're nervous. Their self-doubt is coming from networking, right? Yeah. So here you and I are like talking like kids these days, they have it so easy, <laughs> but now they have this extra layer of like, there's still that self-doubt that right. hasn't changed. And so they're you know, apprehensive about emailing somebody they don't know to introduce right. themselves. And I'm like, that is the best thing you can do. Like people want yeah. to help and want to talk to you, but they can only say right. yes if you ask the question. So I love hearing you talk about networking. I talk about it all the time and the power it has to help you grow your career. And it sounds like right. to me, you were, you, we were doing, I swear we were doing the same thing, doing the same thing. Just when we're at events, trying to say hi to people, introduce ourselves, get a yeah. business card, you know, follow up just for the sake of not even trying to get a job, but just to expand yeah. our network. 
and just get a sense of professional demeanor, to be honest, like just understanding how these women in these senior roles operated and how they got there, yes. you know, it was, it was, it's key. It was key. It was key to just be sort of open and like a sponge, just getting all these ideas and pointers from these women who paid their dues and they earned their spot. Mm -hmm. That's really yeah. good. How did mom and dad feel about the uh, interview at the Dodgers? Oh my goodness. So I kept it, I think there was like three or four rounds. I can't remember. There, there was at least three interview rounds. So one over the phone, I scored the one in person. And then the third or fourth one was kind of with higher level individuals of the Dodgers. I only told them when I was at that last round and they were over the moon, particularly because one of the most well-known Ecuadorians is Jaime Javin. Yep. who is the Spanish broadcaster for the Dodgers, one of the only Latino broadcaster Hall of Famers, mm -hmm. baseball Hall of Fame, obviously. He is, like, huge. You know where my parents are from. They're like, oh, my gosh, Jaime Harin. Like, it was a big thing. And I was just like, keep your fingers crossed. I just want to let you guys know. I, ha I think I'm going to find out soon. Um, but at that point, I did feel confident that I was going to get good news just because I had been in there more than a few times and, felt I really aptly communicated myself. And all those experiences leading up did give me the confidence once that door opened for me to walk in and be like, this job is mine. Yes. This is my job. Yes. And, so, I love that. It's okay to have know? that self-doubt, but you took the right steps. You talked to somebody, you know, you talked to your network of women or your squad of women, and then you educated yourself and were resourceful and were looking things up. And then you were networking. And then when the door, like once you finally had that interview, and I'm sure the second you opened your mouth, the self-doubt probably went away, right? 100%. That was the first moment in my career where I felt fully myself and fully ready to just take on the sports world. I felt I am going to get this job. It is mine. I'm going to aptly communicate why I'm qualified knowing that it's mine, having the confidence going in there already thinking, this is my job. I'm just sort of going through formalities. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know I, what I mean? I love that. This is amazing because you're, you're both sides. Like you have the self-doubt and you have said, it's normal. I had it. But your confidence in yourself seems to be stronger is what I'm seeing. 100%. Such a turning point. And of course, I ended up at the Daughters in 2007, where we met a few years later. The role at first was more business, Latino PR angles. It evolved over the course of several years into so much more, as you can imagine. That was obviously a pivotal moment in my career in terms of fully immersing myself in, its, in the sports business, understanding all elements, having the opportunities to work with every single department and also in the capacity of Latino marketing, Latino PR, and years down the line before MLB implemented this requirement of having a team translator, of jumping in, helping in, in, in that role. I mean, it just, it snowballed really into a lot of things and a huge move. So yeah, ended up there 10 seasons. There is a, what would I've done differently a moment in these years. Oh, sure. If we, want, if, we, if we want to get to that. Um, yeah. Like I said, I wanted to be super candid. So this is helpful to hopefully those who are listening to the podcast. I think it's really important. Sometimes you have these big victories, right? My big victory was getting offered the role of the Dodgers, being with one of the most well-known sports teams in the world. And suddenly you find yourself feeling like, okay, I made it, right? This is it. And you need to constantly evolve. It's good to fully commit yourself to, to opportunities and jobs in the course of your career. But one thing I wanted to emphasize is that you definitely need to revisit and make sure your goals are being met throughout the course of this dream career that you're in. What does that mean in terms of what I would have done differently? I will be honest when, when I tell you that looking back and taking into account what I do now at Wasserman, and being in the sports agency world, in the talent representation business, I would have shifted into that world way sooner. I would probably have done five years at the Dodgers instead of a decade. 
for a couple of reasons. Your goals are constantly changing in life, whether personal or professional. Yeah. And I know you, you feel me on this because I feel like we're around the same age. There comes a time where you, you know, you have different, your priorities are going to shift all the time throughout different periods of, of your, you know, of your career, of your life. So being strategic about the moves that you make in your career that will be most productive and most welcoming to all the other goals that you have that are not work related is really important too. So you have to really be honest about what do you want your whole life to look like? Okay. Not just like, hey, I have this dream job and I'm just going to keep going and going and you don't really identify what is that end goal. Uh, and I think I, I fell into that at the Dodgers where I wouldn't say I was comfortable, but there were enough challenges being presented year after year and the role has had evolved enough year after year that I felt a certain level of, of invigoration, inspiration up to a point. I will say the last couple of years were very challenging for me there. And I was very eager to find what that next step would be. But I'm saying the point being, I should have sought that next step and mapped out accordingly way sooner. Mm -hmm. And an important point as well, I feel like for women in sports, especially women, diverse women in sports, when we're talking about years in your career, we're talking about long-term wealth and long-term, what your long-term salary looks like, what your salary, what your title, what have you will be five, 10 years from now. It's not just this pocket of time. So if you're not super strategic about it and shift accordingly and kind of assess regularly, you can find yourself in, in a spot where you're kind of long-term, possibly hindering your career and your long-term success as it pertains to financial. Because let's be real here, you know, for women in sports, we're still fighting that pay equity battle. It's not there yet. Mm -hmm. We're still fighting that diversity um, need, especially in baseball. We're yes. so lacking massive representation, especially by black women in sports, in baseball, mm -hmm. Latina women as well. It is imperative, I think, that especially, you know, younger women getting into the business to just not just be as strate strategic as you can. Mm -hmm. Reevaluate all the time. And your goals, like I said, and what you want is going to change naturally, you know, wow. as you go through your life. But just keep it on your toes. You know, you have to keep on your toes. So if I had to do it differently, I probably would have done five years and shifted to the sports agency business because at that time I felt like I had achieved, you know, what, once that mark came, if I'm looking back on that time, you know, in my career, there wasn't much else I could do in that role. There wasn't much else mapped out for me. And I will be very honest with you as well. You know, one of the challenges for me is I wanted to make it work. I wanted to make it work long-term. And what I found myself doing and please do this. I advise it for everyone. You know, if you do have this passion for the job you're in, for the organization you're associated with, year after year, I would go in and sort of not plead my case, but I would have a summary of everything I had done throughout the year, very tangible things mm -hmm. before I asked for what I wanted or what I, what I felt like my career could go into. And it got to a point where it wasn't progressing for whatever reason. There could be a million reasons why or why not, probably a conversation for a different pod, but there had to have been a point where I should have just taken the L, reshifted, identified what I was wanting to do, which is what I'm doing now, mm. and gone full, full on after that. And use all that energy, you know, that I put into, into you know, these summaries and making cases for myself, et cetera, put it all into putting myself out there again. But sometimes it takes a little longer than you think, again, to visualize where you want to be. And that's completely okay. But if I'm being honest, I probably could have done it five years before. I did know at one point that being on the player side is what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I think that's important because I feel like we talk a lot about our victories, but we don't talk a lot about what we would have done differently. And I share this because I think if I heard this, if I was listening to your <laughs> to your pod a few years back or whatnot, or um, I, I would I would have found it helpful. I would be like, wow, this person is speaking to me. This is me. <laughs> I, <laughs> like I, I, mm -hmm. You know, I need to hear that. What I think constantly evolve is key because things do change. You're not going to have the same goals that you had, you know, when you first started out in your career. Things things just change, and, and that's a good thing. Right. So it's just constantly evolving, revisiting your goals, playing the long game. What I liked what you said was you talked about how you went in every year and talked about 
all your accomplishments, right? So really what you were doing was advocating for yourself. Yes. Yeah, so that was, you know, that was the intention behind that. I felt that at that time and in the space I was in my career, my position there, I felt that was the best route for me to have a shot at sort of steering my job or attaining the promotion that I had desired was to be my own advocate, to speak just in a direct fashion and, you know, have all the receipts, so to speak, yeah. <laughs> you know, about what I had done and how I'd progressed and basically showing my value in a tangible way. It'll be a different at different jobs. I think some managers, supervisors do a good job of sort of keeping track of employees' progress and how they evolve and what they bring to the table. Um, others don't really just because, especially in baseball, I think I can only speak to my experience, but within baseball, with all the stuff that's going on, with the length of the season, with the hours, understandably, is it is a tougher task to put in that time and sort of map out certain employees' career course. Now, I'm sure that everyone tries to get better every year, but that was the situation that I felt like I needed to uh -huh. really be blunt about it. But what I learned, and I guess this was the segue into ending up at Wasserman, what I did learn in another important lesson is a lot of people will say, you know, your work speaks for itself. And it does. The right people always notice what you're doing. I cannot emphasize that enough. So I always sort of focused on that during challenging times. It's like, I'm confident in what I'm doing. I'm confident in the value I'm bringing to my role here at the Dodgers. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in this vast network of people that had come along with the Dodgers and me, again, taking the opportunity to network at the Dodgers, at Dodger Stadium. There's so many people like off the field, on the field, when you're down there for BP, from all walks of life, that if you feel like having conversations, you can have conversations. And Jahan, that was like the next step, right? Mm -hmm. So I maximized those opportunities that were given to me at the Dodgers. My connections within LA grew. I met people from the music industry. I met people from... I mean, every walk of life, every sort of avenue you could, you could think of that now helped me in my job now. I mean, if there was a celebrity being escorted into the field, I talked to their agent. I talked to their manager. Mm -hmm. I had conversations. A few years into the Dodgers, I started to understand the player representation piece of it, that there were these guys sitting in the dugout club seats during BP visiting with clients who work for agencies who represented players. What is that all about? Like, I, I want to be, <laughs> I want to be perched in the dugout club visiting with clients. Like, what is this business about, right? So again, starting to have conversations with these individuals who were there visiting clients. I introduced myself and got to know, like, Nez Bolello from CAA. I even, at one point, introduced myself to Scott Boris. I introduced myself to various agents and agencies, including my current employer, Wasserman, Andy Moda who initially brought me in, represented players on the Dodgers, and Adam Katz, who's the co-head of baseball, had represented Dodger players for decades. Mm -hmm. And they were around. And anytime they were at the stadium, trust me, I was over there saying hello, asking how they were doing, having these conversations. Hey, if you, you know, if I can help with anything with any of your clients, please let me know. And sometimes there were opportunities where like, actually, hey, I'm trying to get this to him, or we were going to do this. Like, can you help us out? Can you hand this envelope to him in the clubhouse or whatnot? I'm making something up. It could be easy things because I was a PR person or just, hey, can actually, can you help me get him, his mom a field pass? Like, I didn't really know who to call, but maybe you can help. Things of that nature. So again, networking in a way where you're showing and just developing relationships in a natural manner. Jahan, it wasn't, hey, I'm Yvonne. I want a job with your agency right away. It was not at all. Yvonne is not messing around. She is sharing her lessons learned because she wants to help other women in sports. And guess what? She has a lot more to share. So join me next week when she gets into her journey of how she created a job for herself that did not exist at Wasserman. Thank you for listening. I would love to stay connected with you. 
You can follow me on Instagram at Jahan Blake. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. If you're interested in learning more about how I can support you in your journey in the sports industry, email me at jblake at the jblakegroup.com or send me a DM on Instagram. I look forward to hearing from you.